Ronald Edward Santo, Ron, Chicago National League, 1960 to 1973, Chicago American League, 1974, Chicago's beloved third baseman. He belted home runs and snared line drives for 14 seasons at Wrigley Field, plus one final year at Comiskey Park. A nine-time All-Star and a five-time Gold Glove Award winner, he was the grit and the glue of the Cubs lineup of the 1960s. He hit 342 career home runs, eight times belting 25 or more, tallied 2,254 hits, and batted 277 with 1,331 runs batted in. Following his playing career, added to his legend as a Cubs broadcaster and served as an inspiration to millions through a courageous fight with diabetes. Ron Santos' widow, Vicky Santo, there to accept the Hall of Fame plaque. Tom, I think we can, you know, we all understand this This took too long, but it is happening now, and Ron Santos' name will be among the all-time greats for generations to come. Yeah, one of the many touching signs here, Ron, you're finally home, I think says it all. Long time coming, certainly well-deserved. Slightly bittersweet, obviously, for him not to enjoy the moment himself, but terrific career, and I'm glad that the they mentioned during the on the plaque about his fight against diabetes. Thank you, Commissioner Selig, and thank you to James Forbes Clark, Jeff Idelson, Brad Horn, and Whitney Sullivan, and everyone here at the Hall of Fame for your warm and welcoming hospitality this year. Another congratulations to Bob Elliott and Tim McCarver. And congratulations, Barry Larkin. I know Ron would be honored to be in the same Hall of Fame as, you, as class as you are. Thank you to the Golden Era Committee, to Ron's teammates, Ernie Banks, Fergie Jenkins, and especially Billy Williams, for doing so much to help make this day happen. Words cannot express my sorrow that Ron Santo didn't live to see this day, that he's not here to give this speech. Believe me when I tell you, I'd rather have Ron up here than me. But rest assured that he's laughing at my expense to see me squirm a little bit. But this is not a sad day, not at all. This is a very happy day. It's an incredible day for an incredible man, a man who lived an extraordinary life to its fullest. Indeed, he had a wonderful life. From the humble beginnings of Gar Garlic Gulch to the Baseball Hall of Fame, it was a spectacular journey, fraught with trials and tribulations and incredible lows and highs. But Ron's life was never about the lows. He always found a way to make it about the highs. Ron Santo was born to play baseball. He said his ability to play baseball was a God-given gift that playing the game was easy, that it was only the diabetes that made the game hard. Looking back, he believed he was given the gift of talent as well as the challenge of diabetes so that through his hardship, he could shed light on a cause, that he could help others through his story. And I think he would say that's why he's now been given the greatest honor any athlete could ever hope for from a sport, to be included among the greatest players who've ever set foot on earth. You see, long before science and technology caught up to diabetes, Ron Santo was as much a guinea pig as he was a baseball player. On a given day, he played doctor and patient, as well as third base. He tested his sugars by taking batting practice. He checked his glucose levels by fielding grounders. He gauged the amount of insulin he would need after running the bases. And this was before the game even started. His prescription was often a candy bar or a glass of orange juice. 
never letting on that his sugars were low or telling his teammates about his daily injections. But without the difficulties, what value would have been the gift? What meaning would have been the journey? It never held him back, not before his career, not during and not after, not even after double amputations, because Ron Santo believed it's not what happens to you in life that people may judge, but how you handle what happens to you in your life. Ron told this story many times about an afternoon at Wrigley Field when he was really struggling. The low sugar came over him very quickly, as it sometimes did, and suddenly he found himself in the on-deck circle. Don Kessinger and Glenn Beckert had already reached base. Billy Williams was at the plate, and Ron's sugar was really low. It got so bad, as Billy took his sweet time up there working the count, that Ron was hoping Billy would just strike out so he could end the inning and get back to the dugout for a candy bar. But Billy walked to load the bases. Now Ron really had a problem. His vision was blurry and he was weak. His plan was to hit the first pitch, but he didn't count on seeing three balls coming to him. So he picked the middle of the three and swung hard. He did it, a grand slam. But as they ran the bases, Billy was jogging, enjoying the moment, and Ron quickly caught up to him. Billy said, hey, don't pass me up. What's your hurry? Ron said, you better get moving, Whistler, or I'm running right around you. Billy picked up the pace, and they got off the field. But it wasn't until years later that Ron explained why he needed to get off the field. He hid his diabetes for a decade. He was afraid they might take baseball away from him. That's a long time to keep a secret. Indeed, he was in so many ways a guinea pig. When Ron retired from playing, he often thought about getting back into baseball. When WGN Radio and the Chicago Cubs called and the broadcast booth beckoned, he jumped and clicked his heels at the thought of working with Tom Brennerman and Bob Brenly and later Pat Hughes. What a team they were. In 2001, Ron lost a leg, amputated because of the complications of diabetes. It had been a terrible fight. 10 operations in 10 months. The next year, he had a sore on the other foot and was faced with a decision. After weighing the odds of a full recovery and no recurrence, he decided to go with a second amputation. As the nurse was wheeling him into the operating room, I heard him telling the doctor that the timing was perfect for this operation because he could be back for opening day. That's true. Only Ron. That's what was on his mind, getting ready to broadcast Cubs baseball on opening day. He handled his diabetes with grace dignity, and a sense of humor. As he left for the ballpark with the glucometer and insulin, we would joke about getting him an owner's manual. In case any of the bionic parts were to break down, someone would be able to help him. So how did he keep broadcasting despite it all? Two men, Dr. Gary Kaufman and Ray McKinney, who we affectionately referred to as our leg man kept him upright and walking. I'm really sure of one thing. When each of them met Ron, they did not know they would be on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. A very special thank you to Gary and Ray, who made the quality of Ron's last few years remarkable and allowed him to get to the broadcast booth to share his passion for the game and his sense of humor with his fans. Not only was Ron's vision of color commentating to tell the listeners how a player thinks about different situations, but he related from the standpoint of being the world's greatest Cub fan. He had no emotional filter. 
So when you listened, you heard and felt the joy or sadness of a real fan. He loved the game, and he loved the broadcast booth. He wasn't going to let anything prevent him from broadcasting the season. That was Ron. He never said, why me? He just moved on to the next challenge. The last few years of his life, he had so many things wrong with him and so many different needs that every single thing that we take for granted, like taking a shower or making a sandwich, required a lot of different moving parts. But he did not complain, and he did not want sympathy. He believed he'd been chosen to go through these things so that he could deliver a message of perseverance, to inspire those with problems of all types. And above all, he felt it was his job to try to find a cure for juvenile diabetes. I assure you, if Ron wanted something a certain way, it was going to be that way. He would not have stood up here today and bragged about what he has done to try to help others. So the one advantage to him not being here is, in this case, he can't tell me what to say. So I'm going to brag just a little about him. You'll never know all he did for others, and he did so very much in private. In public, he raised more than $65 million for JDRF. He felt he had been put here for that reason. He felt it was his reason for still being here when the odds were so stacked against him the last decade of his life. He embraced his gift and his hardship equally, believing that one would not have mattered without the other. He believed in his journey and he believed in his cause. His journey has led him here to Cooperstown and his cause is finding a cure. He fought the good fight, and though he's no longer here, we must find a cure. Ron always believed in a season in which the Cubs could win. He always believed the game was within reach. We can't, he also always believed we would find a cure. We can't let him down. Walk for the cure, run for the cure, donate to research for the cure, or just pray for a cure, but find a cure. If you want to honor Ron Santo, there's nothing you can do more appropriate than in some way helping to find the cure. I think you all know how intense Ron was. Rather, whether it was on the field, in the broadcast booth, or in his fight against diabetes. And Ron loved with the same intensity. He loved his friends and he loved his family, especially his children, Ron, Jeff, Linda, and Kelly and his grandsons, Sam and Spencer. The intensity that Ron lived with will live on through our family's efforts to find a cure for the disease that so challenged him for 51 years of his life. And in his legacy, let it be known that here is a man who attained the highest honor his sport can give while playing with an insidious disease. He was an inspiration and he will continue to be an inspiration. Perhaps more than anything, he loved the Cubs. God, how he loved the Cubs and the Cubs fans. Really, I want you to know he loved you all so much, and he would be so grateful that you came here today to share this with him. Thank you to the Cubs organization for appreciating and honoring Ron for his talents as a player and a broadcaster. Thank you to Cub fans for being his friends, for being his family, and for always being there for him. You'll never know how much that meant to him. Thank you all from my heart for being here today for Ron. I look at his plaque here in Cooperstown, and I think you will all agree. It just feels right as a perfect ending to his remarkable journey. I couldn't help of thinking of 
think of Jimmy Stewart in It's a Wonderful Life when the angel Clarence says, each man's life touches so many other lives. When he isn't around, he leaves an awful hole, doesn't he? Ron never needed that lesson, but Ron left an awful hole for so many of us here today. I always think of how Clarence inscribed that copy of Tom Sawyer and George Bailey holds at the end of the movie. Remember, George, no man is a failure who has friends. Well, I don't know of anyone who had more friends than Ron Santo. This is not a sad day. This is a great day. Celebrate for Ron. Celebrate with us and celebrate with him. Because I'm certain of few things, but I am certain that Ronnie is celebrating with us right now. Celebrate his journey. Celebrate his cause. Celebrate an amazing life. Celebrate Ron Santos' life. He truly had a wonderful life. Thank you. God bless.